Hello and welcome to episode number three, A Sold Cloak. Uh, good to see all of y'all. And we are going to be discussing recovering from collapse today, um, kind of following up what we did uh, last uh, last episode, discussing the overview of collapse and everything. So, uh, Dan, you want to you wanna go ahead and open us up in prayer? Sure, I can do that. Lord, I thank you for this day, for your many blessings. Uh, I do still thank you for the nation in which we live, as opposed to many other nations around this world. And I pray for our leaders, those that have been elected to represent us in this republic. And I pray that they would look to you for wisdom and guidance and direction. God, I do pray that you guide our conversation today and help it to be of edification to someone out there who might benefit from this. And we'll give you the praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. So uh, we are going to read from the U.S. Constitution, and we'll be reading Article 1, Section 2 today. So, uh, Jack, you want to take, uh, take this one? I'll take a crack at it. It says, uh, Section 2 of the U.S. Constitution. The House of Representatives shall be composed of members chosen every second year by the people of the several states, and the electors in each state shall have the qualifications requisite for electors of the most numerous branch of the state legislature. No person shall be a representative who shall not have attained to the age of 25 years and been seven years a citizen of the United States and who shall not, when elected, be an inhabitant of the state in which he shall be chosen. Representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states, which may be included within this union, according to the respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years, and excluding Indians not taxed three-fifths of all other persons, the actual enumeration shall be made within three years after the first meeting of the Congress of the United States, and within every subsequent term of ten years, in such manner as they shall be law direct. The number of representatives shall not exceed one for every thirty thousand, but each state shall have at least one representative, and until such enumeration shall be made, the state of New Hampshire shall be entitled to choose three, Massachusetts 8, Rhode Island and Providence Plantations 1, Connecticut 5, New York 6, New Jersey 4, Pennsylvania 8, Delaware 1, Maryland 6, Virginia 10, North Carolina 5, South Carolina 5, and Georgia 3. When vacancies happen in the representation from any state, the executive authority thereof shall issue writ of election to fill such vacancies. The House of Representatives shall choose their speaker and other officers and shall have the sole power of impeachment. Thank you very much. And I have a little note written here for the um, right where it says three-fifths of all other persons. I have a little uh, asterisk there. And at the, the end of this, it says... Uh, the part of this clause relating to the mode of apportionment of representatives among the several states has been affected by Section 2 of Amendment 14 and as to taxes on incomes without apportionment by Amendment 16. So, Right, those things have been changed. To protect the innocent? Or at least one of them. <laughs> one of them, the other one not. <laughs> the other one not so much. <laughs> oh, goodness. All righty, so... Mm. Talking about recovering from collapse, so assuming that there has been a collapse already, you know, how would we handle that? What are what are good, I guess, overview ideas? Maybe even uh, uh, like detailed, just good advice uh, ideas that y'all would y'all would think. Of. of course, that's depending. Can I help you? Hmm? Oh, right. <clears throat> you give me the, the weird eyes. I don't know what that means. Yeah, I mean. Earlier, you had commented, just don't touch your boom while you were talking. Yeah, I'm sorry. Here, you were moving I'm, and touching your boom while I'm, you were the one speaking. Yeah, just, I'm a bad just person. Just observation. I'm a hypocrite. But I didn't say anything. The eyes were too much. <laughs> the eyes were way too much. <laughs> anyway, couldn't do it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so you're, yeah, so you're talking about the, um, the stages, just like we talked about the stages of preparation. Mm -hmm. There are stages of recovery. Yeah, and of course that depends on what exactly collapsed you know if you did just have that category one market collapse you know i'm thinking just like with the great depression people have to to be a little bit more self-sufficient uh communities have to take care of each other a little bit more families have to stick together more and people have to learn more skills and just 
deal with it until the market recovers. You know, I don't, I don't, there's no cheating way to fix it. I don't believe. Um, Right. And in that situation, you you still have the authority of government. Yeah. Yeah. It's just the market. They don't, you know, they don't relinquish authority or, you know, have it taken from them. Yeah. And like you were saying last time, if you have already started on your list of preparations and you're partially, partially through, if you do have a market collapse, you are kind of ready to, to handle stuff. You got some, some livestock already. You've got some gardening skills or whatnot. You've got some, you know, friends y'all can y'all can swap goods and and services and whatnot you've already been pushing yourself out of your comfort zone to learn more skills and those sorts of things so you're already kind of as prepared as you get for a market collapse and then for a like a soft political collapse that category two or maybe the exact government that we have right now might collapse but there may be is you know states that are able to act as independent nations or, you know, whatever the case may be. I'm, I'm imagining kind of like how we talked about last time of if you're on that sinking ship, you know, you want to be on the, the largest functional floating object that you can get, you know, the, the biggest uh, dinghy or a little scrap of wood, if that's the best thing you can grab onto. So like, let's say, you know, we're, we're in Texas, if, if the U.S. ceased to function, kind of like how the USSR just kind of unraveled that, um, we as a constituent state, we should, we would just try our best to keep the government that we have with our, our governor and our legislature and all that kind of stuff, keep as much in place as we can and become an independent nation and make all the changes necessary to be able to do that and um, try to do that as smooth as, smooth, smooth as possible. That's and we're a step ahead. Right. In Texas, you mean? Yes. A step ahead who? Mississippi? <laughs> Anybody else. We were already a republic and we... Already have a constitution that we could fall back on. But California was a republic for about 30 days. So? They don't count. That? Vermont was independent for like a couple weeks or yeah. something. I no. don't know. Uh-uh. Yeah. That doesn't count? No. No. Oh. <clears throat> you got to get a legislative body together and vote on something. But they had a really cool flag. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't count. But, yeah. But, that's, and, but see, that's one of the things that our state is doing as an entity is preparing yeah. for a federal collapse. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have talked to our representatives in our state house about this and said, you know, what, what, you know, you, you said you're pro secession. What are you doing? And I said, well, we're working on a monetary system. We're working right. on a gold reserve. We are planning for this collapse. So just like you plan as an individual, mm-hmm. having a thought this through and expected some sort of problem that would be a much softer collapse for us in our region oh, yeah, yeah. because we do have a big boat. Essentially, we yeah. have been working on building a lifeboat mm-hmm. as a state. You know, we, our, our grid is independent. Now, sometimes that isn't nice. <laughs> yeah, you sometimes. Know, the grid was, you know, it yeah. went down and everybody makes fun of us. It's like, yeah, well, you know, it was a problem. It mm. wasn't as robust as it should have been, and it's going to be better now. But, but that does also, let you know that it goes both ways. If the other grid goes down, we, stay we can still right. stay there up. Is, right. There it is not interconnected and yeah. for good or bad. And, um, you know, so things like that, those are steps that yeah. are being now, taken. Now, the interesting part about that, though, is that... Did you just say that we're... Yeah. Yes. We're not supposed to be saying where we are in Texas. <sighs> Breaking the rules. Sorry. Every time. Just, we, the, just, just, just say um, a little closer every time. <laughs> just say there, there are areas in Texas that uh, no. Whatever, man. are interconnected. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Like episode 12. Okay, guys, we live here. Okay. <laughs> this, this is, is my home address. <laughs> this is my social security number. <laughs> my grid coordinates are... <laughs> <laughs> well, but, uh, but but yes, there is. A, it is not a, a straight scalpel edge on the border of Texas that the grid follows because it wasn't feasible. Right. There, there yeah. are areas where the Texas grid goes into other states a little bit, and yeah. there are places where the other states or other countries' grid comes into ours a little bit. But most of it is all sectioned off. Is that called ERCOT? Is that the name of it? Our, our independent our grid system? ERCOT is... Um, not an independent grid system. It is the overarching body that regulates the independent grid system. Okay. Yeah, I see. Now, uh, something interesting, I guess, is the borders of Texas don't exactly have to stay the same. Hypothetically, we're talking about, we're just using Texas as an example. It's it's everybody's go-to example of uh, a state seceding. Because it's so cool. 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but I mean, bear in mind, Texas wasn't the Texas shape when it was the state of Mexico. Correct. You know, and it's, it's changed shape a number of times through, you know, through processes and revolutions and all that kind of stuff. So we, we don't necessarily have to be too concerned about the exact alignment of, you know, the, the grid and whatnot, but right. Yeah. The and, hard thing is just carving Austin out and giving that to a blue state. That's, that's the hard thing. No, you can. airports only. <laughs> but I mean, just to the point, like it would be much easier to section out the panhandle mm-hmm. or it would be easy to section out the area where El Paso is and those few counties there. and Or to section, section things off. in. Or could, to section things in. You know, I, I always like natural borders. They're the ones that they make the most sense to me. I don't like all this weird like flat lines like Wyoming and all that stuff. So if you start in Colorado, you have the Rio Grande River coming out of the mountains in Colorado. Mm-hmm. And you also have the Arkansas River coming out of Colorado, like right next to it. They both start in almost the exact same area of the mountain range. And then it goes all the way to the Mississippi. And then the Mississippi, of course, goes all the way down. I'm like, look at that. Rivers all the way around. But that's just me being crazy. I don't know. I like maps. And Texas Secession. <laughs> I should stop thinking about those things together. <laughs> yeah. That's not good. <clears throat> yeah. But that 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 would be in in a collapse, it would be ideal to have already had a plan. Yeah. Already have some some preparation mm-hmm. for that. Um, and sometimes if you're if you're realizing that, you know, the ship isn't sinking, but the the captain is drunk and you know we're going through an ice field and this is not good you might want to start getting your dinghy all ready now which is kind of like what we're, we're doing right now with the with the texas secession bill that's currently in our state congress <clears throat> i don't know how much traction it's gotten i don't think it's i think it's been read and introduced but i don't think it, uh, anything else has happened on it yet this this particular bill has died before uh in committee right uh, but I, I believe the committee chairman of that committee has not been reelected. So um, hopefully the same thing won't happen again. But I think that's a reasonable thing when you're thinking, you know what, if the ship is going down, I don't really want to wait and make it an emergency. Let's, right. let's start getting and, the ropes ready. And <laughs> even even if the secession movement doesn't come to fruition before a collapse, mm-hmm. by doing the thought process, how would we run our economy? Mm-hmm. How would we do our resources? Would we have trade deals? Thinking about all those things that you think about before you secede mm-hmm. so that it can be smooth and yeah. peaceful um, are going to all be things that it will pay dividends to have thought about and plan oh, yeah. for yeah. In, in the emergency. You know, if you've already got everything written up and you've been arguing over the fine details and you weren't really sure exactly how you wanted to go forward, and then everything starts collapsing mm-hmm. around you. You say, "Well, you know what? Let's just grab what we've got, yeah, <laughs> right, and we'll work on the fixing it a little bit later, and mm-hmm. we'll just implement the thing we've been arguing over for ten years, where we're like, you know, six one half dozen the other almost, yeah, and yeah. Uh, yeah. So that meanwhile in Portland, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Who started this fire? <laughs> that was the it's other the same fire, <laughs> <laughs> just different locations. Oh, um, goodness. But uh, yeah, and that's something I really like. I know I, I read the bill uh, last time. I, I, I'm assuming it's the same wording or almost the same wording. It's a slightly different title. I, I scanned it and it's the same number of pages. So I'm just, they didn't. It's not an omnibus bill that they just threw everything into. Uh, but last time it was a very reasonable like we're going to you know of course the legislature is just going to vote that we're going to have a referendum, not that we're actually going to do it, so that it would become a referendum in November, whenever it w- would get accepted. And then if the people do vote yay on the, nef- uh, the the referendum, then that would um that would start, I think it's a five-year process. And it would be doing just those things, figuring out, okay, how are we going to handle currency? Because obviously we use U.S. dollars from the Federal Reserve. We got to get our own system. Are we going to be able to do some sort of like buyback thing where everybody can swap out their money, you know, getting all that stuff, stuff sorted, military, uh, our relations with the United States now, like trade deals we might have you know, uh, citizenship, border crossings, you got five years to figure all those details out to avoid any sort of Fort Sumter type situation, which I think is definitely what you, you want to avoid. You don't want to just have a, an emotional knee jerk reaction, you know, half the country secedes and then nobody's sorted out who owns the, the federal forts in the seceded area, you know? So, right. Yeah, so that's, uh, I think it is a good idea to be thinking about those sorts of things and, and have that 
stuff prepared so you don't I mean, you don't want to you don't want a violent altercation like with the Civil War, but you also don't want just a chaotic system of you know nobody knows what's going on, and and that's how you get famines and people starving and gangs and all that sort of stuff, and that's no good. So right, yeah. Anytime there's not a cohesive plan, thought process, rules, you you people fall through the cracks, and there's problems. So the more more prepared for it, the better. Yeah. So in our in our situation, you know, we happen to be in Texas. It, I think we're in a, a a better situation. You know, Texas. It's large. It's populous. It's it's well off. We don't have like we're not hemorrhaging money like certain other states are. You know, we should be okay in, as an independent nation. Now, of course, people are all over you know the nation, and they may be in in different states. So I would imagine some other states are in in a situation where they could do it. You know. I don't, I don't know the stats on other places as well. I, I just always imagine Utah becoming its own country. I feel like it is already. You know? <laughs> They're just over there doing their own thing. They can like their, well, whatever. <laughs> I don't want to go too far into that. But, um, yeah. you know, and, uh, but some places I'd imagine are just, they're not, they're not prime locations. You know, there's, they're just going to be chaotic areas for quite a while, you know. So if somebody happens to be in there and they do think that there's some sort of like, political breakdown coming i would imagine that they would want to leave and according to the the maps that i've been looking at of people <laughs> migrating um that's what they're doing yeah. <laughs> so, so you're talking about the entire west coast uh yeah the west west coast is moving yeah, for the coast. most part yeah. yeah now greater idaho that could probably be its own its yeah. own chunk and they're you know? they're working on it you know yeah. i think yeah. that would be a great idea and and if we could do that kind of stuff more like let's say you you had greater idaho happen and it's just one big state now i think if you allow people to make smaller changes like that then you wouldn't require big huge dangerous ones like you know civil war kind of stuff you know you could you could resolve the tensions by by dealing with things like that and having more uh state um what do you call the state's rights situation but oh like it was intended to be be. exactly yes right yeah (laughs) oh goodness Uh, a loosely affiliated group of countries. Yeah. States yeah. of America. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's pretty, it's kind of in a way out of, out of our hands directly. If, if that's the situation, if it's the U S that breaks down in Texas and other areas are able to band together and have smaller constituent States and they, they make their own independent nations. That's kind of like up to our legislatures, governors, all that kind of stuff. Um, Right. Obviously, we want to be diligent citizens and hold our representatives accountable if they're doing something good or bad, you know. And voting with our feet. Yeah, which people are doing. <laughs> right. So, yeah. you know, go to the places. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're in New York City, it's not a great place to be. Go to a place where you are going to um, align politically uh, and, you know, just the same morals. Mm-hmm. You know, same, where you can have a community that you can trust. Yeah. Right. And... um and so when things split up, you're in the right spot for you. Yeah. What I thought was interesting, I, I put a link to this in the show notes of the, the previous episode, but there was a, that map I'm talking about that somebody had sent me, the migration one and everything. And you can see areas like the Northeast, and it's all just colored in such a way that all the migration is a net um, outward migration. And you have some places like Tennessee that are just like a bunch of net positive uh, migration. And then you have places like uh, Dallas, which is a good example of this, is, like, is the people are leaving the, the urban area, but it's a little donut around it because right. they don't want to leave Texas. They just want to leave the big cities in Texas, you know? So you got right. the yeah, cities up north that they just want to leave every part, like, <laughs> whether yeah. it's city or not, you know? And then, yeah, down here, well, I want to stay here. Just But that's have what a we're land. seeing donuts around all of those major cities. Dallas, mm-hmm. Fort Worth, you're seeing that major expansion all the way around, just yeah. like Austin, just like San Antonio, just like Houston. Well, Austin was a little bit different. And it was actually a net positive all all through. And I believe the reason is that f- for that is people that are coming from New York and California that are like the the big business people, the tech people, all that kind right. of stuff. That's the place to go, you know. So for right the better, there. for the better or for the worse, I think it's just going to grow conglomerate. You know? And and Austin is such a weird place. It is in the world. You know, yeah. you've got all these tech millionaires and billionaires. Yeah. A lot of them who are conservative now. And they're living there. And then you've got the crazy liberal whack jobs who mm-hmm. are living there. And you got Alex Jones, you know. <laughs> and you just the, the the group of people yeah. 
in Austin is a really weird group of people. You know, I don't I don't think this is the way that they'd be proud of it, but it is diverse. <laughs> That's not what they're it, going for. I don't think really that is. kind of diversity, but it is very diverse. It's truly diverse. <laughs> and it's one of the only cities. I mean, it, it really is mm. a diverse place. You, you got you got our capital there and their their past and, you know, open carry laws and all this stuff and and all the people throughout the state are like oh yeah and of course the the austinites are probably rolling their eyes and and unhappy a lot of them i've talked to some of them i mean i've talked to people on the street a few years ago i just i was curious you know Mm -hmm. you know you hear about austin but i was there and just asking people and you i got all of the answers (laughs) i got i saw ultra conservatives yeah ultra liberals all you know eating at the same taco joint on the side of the road Mm. like it was a very interesting place to be Mm. yeah Mm. so So. i think i think maybe what you were getting at in in uh in your topic idea dan was more the third situation what happens when society collapses on more of a major scale and we don't have the state of texas or we don't have individual counties that are what counties aren't really set up to be independent but if you could you know get a county or or a city government from collapsing you know more of a severe situation where there is there's there's just chaos everybody's running from their their office to go do whatever you know and and there's no one to look to how to build up from scratch you know from from nowhere it's just you and your your immediate surroundings well you know. and, and you would rather not build from scratch yeah that's, yeah, that's what we're saying um, and try so, the biggest thing you can if you can hold your city together your city government and keep your mayor right. and that sort of stuff so maybe come together and have community on that local level mm-hmm. county would be best obviously uh, but if not county at least the city and if not the city at least a community of like-minded people that yeah. are going to cordon off our area and begin to protect, maintain control, and build community with within this zone. Mm-hmm. And and have that, you know, delineated on a map so we know what what our area is. Yeah, yeah. You could patrol it, you could protect it, all that sort of thing. Know right. what resources you have available to you and and whatnot. Yeah. And and that's something I've thought about a lot. Um, the way I feel is, of course, there's different levels of everything, right? Mm-hmm. We fall, but you know, there's one is, you know, the property, you know, I think of my property as the, the final, my final group. Mm-hmm. It doesn't get smaller than that. You know, I'm not an individual because I've got a family. Right. Mm-hmm. So I'll never, I'll never bring it all the way to the individual you know, where I'm a nomad going to find my community, right? I'm Unless ne- that's forced upon you. Right. Unless there's a lot of death, <laughs> right? That would be the only time that I would go to that to that level. And I'd probably want to be one of the first ones to die before that happens. <laughs> so it would be it would be my family that would be nomadic, most likely, um, just the way that we're set up. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of people in my, my small group of friends, my Mm -hmm. closest friends, that either they have a property that they feel the same way or they're linked up and planning to come to my property or planning to go to another friend's property. Mm -hmm. And so there will be these, you know, in the worst, worst case scenario, let's let's say, you know, for the sake of this discussion, because everything, if you go from the worst case, you're going to be building towards the bigger boats, right? We're not going to stay there. Like, I'm not going to be a little tyrant of my own property for the rest of time like that's not my goal oh, come on <laughs> right that would never be the goal the goal supreme would be, king jack come on <laughs> <laughs> of the small small <laughs> land the small realm <laughs> 27 people <laughs> yeah. um but um yeah so you'd be building towards us so if we start from the family unit and and discuss that moving forward you'll hit everything you'll hit way. all of the pieces mm-hmm. on the road and just like you as, <clears throat> as prepare you know you got to prepare in stages you also prepare to rebuild in stages and as far as it goes down that list okay it only it only made it to texas okay well we only have to rebuild back from mm-hmm. that and that might be just solidifying and you know, shoring up, the, shoring, yeah, yeah shoring yeah. that up, building it up, <clears throat> working as the community to make it the best country it can be. Mm-hmm. Right? We might not want to be a larger country than that. Yeah. Um. You know, if it's all, all the way down to the city, eh, that we probably need to link up 
with some a larger group yeah. of people I mean, in order to be in the in the national world. Yeah, there's there's something to be said for for make surviving for a period of time. Like, yeah, okay, you can you can get enough resources to survive a period of time, but to actually just live as a country and just build back up, yeah, you're gonna want to. I'm you're probably not gonna want to be a a tiny little city state. I mean, maybe consider the possibilities. It matters it matters where you are. If you're in a horrible place. Um, and there's only one good city, I guess, make a city state and be done with it, you know. Um, and there's That's been, all you can do. There's been places like, um, you know, uh, Germany or the German area during uh, the Middle Ages. A, a lot of other nations developed really large, you know, the Frankish, you know, kingdom became France. And you had these big, big uh, empires and countries. But Germany was just split up with a whole bunch of tiny little itty bitty kingdoms little dukedoms and all, all these little places little counties with counts <laughs> hence the name mm-hmm. you know and um you have places like bavaria and and all these you know bohemia and these little places and i mean they did survive for hundreds of years as tiny little states of course they had various levels of cooperation with each other at different times and you had times when one would grow and conquer more or whatever you know but um you know it is possible to get by with a very very small country it does depend on what your your neighbors are, though. You know, I mean, you don't really just want to be swallowed up by Mexico <laughs> if you're just, you know, super duper tiny. But, right. Yeah. So, but that's um, yeah. So let's let's go all the way back down to the family size mm-hmm. and say where do we go? Because of course we know each other, obviously, and we would be little satellite family units mm-hmm. with contact. You know, ham radio. We've got. We've got the ability to contact each other mm-hmm. in total grid down. Let's say there's an EMP or, you know, there's a World War Three, and the financial system collapses and the government collapses and the food runs out and there's total chaos and no one shows up to the state legislature building, right? Mm-hmm. Nobody shows up to the county meetings. It is just, at the moment, it's just over. Mm-hmm. So going from there, give us some uh, give us some ideas of of what are the, what's the roadmap look like to get us back to a functioning society. Uh, right, and the first thing that you need to do if you haven't already done it is you know basically assess and inventory your situation. What where am I at? What do I have? What am I lacking? What do I need? Where can I get it? And going forward, you're going to want to uh, make alliances with other families and hopefully establish a market uh, to where we can begin to trade some of those resources. If I have an abundance in something and lack something else that they might have an abundance of, then, you know, building that market and then establishing communities around your your market is your central, um, I guess, cohesion. It would be a priority. Would you say that would come before or after um, organized protection? I'm assuming if if there's chaos and you have you know roving bandits or or whatever, and you got nobody knows what who's in danger of what. You know, would you want to like get some sort of of agreement of you know protecting property and, and, and kind of cordoning off an area for yourself and, and all that before you, you mess with the markets? Or do you think that should be an individual, like, I take care of my place, you take your, care of your place, and we'll... we'll. I think you're going to see that at the beginning. You're going to be taking care of your mm-hmm. own, and the market is going to be the place where we discover news. Oh, there was a raid of bandits that attacked them. And from that point, you're probably going to have people realizing we need to have some alliances here. We need to have some way of having some mutual aid, mutual defense. Right. And, and right now we are satellite little communities that are small because a lot of people don't see the need to be more engaged with their immediate neighbors. They're not preppers. They're not ready for things. But of course, when things have collapsed, you don't have to convince anybody mm-hmm. anymore that prepping was a good idea. Well, right. And that. the hard part about where we are now is we're on the pathway to collapse 
and things are beginning to unravel. Things are beginning to fall apart. But at the same time, people are still having to try and maintain the status quo. And so right. while there's things that I need to be doing on my homestead, I'm not able to because I still have to go to work. Mm -hmm. But one right. of these days, that's going to fall apart. And there is not going to be, I've got to go to work, so I will be on the homestead. But it's that right. that in-between stage that is mm -hmm. very awkward right now for a lot of people. Right. It is. It's very awkward. But also... I mean, the reason we're not going fully on the homestead yet is because working in the society is more efficient. We can get more resources. We can build up our stockpile. We can, mm -hmm. you know, build up our plan. We can buy more tractor parts and things like that by the amount of hours we spend outside of the farmstead benefits the farmstead more or the homestead or whatever you want to call it. You know, it benefits it more per hour of labor because division of labor is more efficient right now. Mm -hmm. um, but at a, there, but it's becoming less efficient as the inflation goes up, mm -hmm. as wages are going down comparatively. Every day we're getting closer to, well, an hour working on the homestead gets me so far, and an hour working in the society to get dollars to buy the things for the homestead gets me so far. Mm -hmm. And at some point we'll go past the tipping point. Right. And we're getting closer every day. I can yeah. feel it. And also, I mean, something to bear in mind is even if you're being less efficient, you're learning. And we've, you know, we've been learning that uh, tending with, with, with chickens and whatnot is there's a lot of things you don't know that you don't know. There's certain diseases and, you know, they're not always predictable. We <clears throat> we had an issue with, with our flock that they got a respiratory disease that they don't ever get over. I didn't know that chickens had eternal diseases, but some of them are eternal and you just got to kill every single one of them. And, um... You know, there's things that even though you're not being efficient, you're learning. Right. Whereas if you only switched over later to find stuff out, you don't want to find out. You have to kill your whole flock when that's all you've got, you know, and you're dependent on that 100%. But something we were talking about last time was, you know, by staying involved in society and everything, it does help to stave off collapse more. You know, if people are still going to work and they're still doing what they're doing presumably if it's an actual useful and productive thing, then that's a useful thing to stave it off a little while longer. If everybody panics right now, well, that's a collapse right now. We, we could just make it happen, self-fulfilling prophecy kind of situation. If everybody that had any sort of homestead or any sort of preps just decided to not show up for work on, you know, Thursday morning, and that was it, we were all going to be self-sufficient as much as possible and pull out of the economy you give it a couple of months and the whole thing crashes. Mm -hmm. So, right. Yeah. So staying, staying involved yeah. is helping to stave it off. Yeah. Um, but you know, you can feel the load getting heavier. I don't know. I, you know, I work in manual labor and the amount of work needed to be done versus the amount of people doing the work, the imbalance is growing every day. Mm -hmm. There's people that are more and more desperate to have, hired help, but they don't have the resources to hire it because they can't afford it. Mm -hmm. And I turn people down doing handyman work. I told them I don't do handyman work anymore because you can't make a living doing it. Right. You can't, but the people are in desperate need. So they're getting scammed. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a little bit of a tangent, but you know, I was brush washing for a family and they were looking for a handyman. And I said, well, there's, there's hardly any honest handyman anymore because you can't make a living. And they're like, whoa, okay, that makes sense because I've been scammed three times in a row. Mm -hmm. I pay half down, the person gets materials, they do a little bit of work, and then they disappear. I said, that's pretty much all we have left. And 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 it's the it's everybody's fault because nobody was willing to pay a handyman that was honest, an honest wage that they could afford to have a family and mm -hmm. be a skilled laborer. And so they all quit and did something else or they're being handymen on their own farm now. You know, they're running their own homestead and they're not out there in the world anymore. They went galt because the handymen are the first ones that can leave. If you can fix anything in a house, if you can build your own house, if you can build your own shed and fix the plumbing, and if you can do all of those things, you're the first person that can just take that skill set and go home and mm -hmm. go galt essentially. Yeah. And that's happened a lot. And so, 
you know, so people's houses are just getting in worse and worse shape. Somebody's like, you know, oh, I've got this roof leak that I've had for six months and I can't find anybody that'll fix it for a reasonable price. And they don't have the finances to replace the whole roof. And that's all that there is, is a, you know, somebody who will rip your whole roof off and put it on. There's nobody mm-hmm. who's going to go patch it. They're not willing to do the work. Yeah. And so it's just slowly getting worse. You know, things like that are happening more and more. And so as the handyman have left, the society gets closer to collapse, you know. And then, mm-hmm. of course, the closer to collapse you get, the more the handyman leave. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a it's a positive feedback loop. That's, it's, it's, that it's is the handyman happening. metric. <laughs> right. Yeah. And the carpenters and, you know, the average carpenters in mm-hmm. their 60s now. I, that's something I have noticed. Whenever you're you're driving around and you see somebody out doing manual labor, the chances of them being over 55 years old is very high. Oh, yeah. Like you don't see a lot of young people, at least in, in our area, you don't see a lot of young people working mm, like that. Anyway. You know? uh, yeah. So. And, and it's scary because, I mean, those guys are, are good at what they do, but I mean, you're going <laughs> to, you're going to pass away eventually. And if people just don't know how to do those tasks, you know, I think that's one issue we've had in our, our society is it's, you know, it's almost like it's a shameful thing to get a, uh, like a blue collar type job, you know, if, if you do good, you're supposed to go to college and, and get, you know, a, a white collar job and everything. And, and, um, yeah, there's, there's no desire for it. Well, and it goes back, uh, decades, the way that they designed the education system to move people into that and to not move people towards vocations and that no child left behind and everybody deserves a college education. And why go to college and spend thousands and thousands of dollars if you don't need a college education to do that vocation? But that is the way public school has really pushed everyone Mm -hmm. uh, into that direction. And so uh, we get what we pay for. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, we're seeing the results of you know, 40, 35, 40 years of a hard push for everybody to go to college. And a society doesn't need most of its people mm-hmm. to go to college. And a lot of people aren't, that's, they would, they would make good handymen. They would make good blue collar, even they you know, specialized skilled blue collar work. Oh yeah. And they're not cut out for, for college and they don't excel academically and they shouldn't be focusing on it. But in our society, if you don't, well, then you must be a, a failure, you know. Right. So they'll they'll make themselves be a less efficient white collar worker and an unhappy white collar worker than be a good blue collar worker, you know. Right. So. That's satisfied with their life. So yeah. that's rough. Yeah. But um, yeah. So let's go back to the um the or the family unit. Mm-hmm. Let's say, you know, all hell breaks loose, and we've got roaming bands of hungry people. Right. That's the nightmare. That's yeah. the worst case scenario. And the first thing we do is you circle the wagons. All of the people who are planning on coming to your homestead that don't have their own, that have been prepping, though, to be ready. You know, we have some friends. Of course, we're not going to say names, but, you know, friends that's, are, that's a nurse. Mm-hmm. That, um, you know, I, I met her years and years ago, and we talked about this. And she's like, you know what? You might be right. I think you're wrong, but you might be right. And they're like, I'm a liberal I, I want to try, you know, liberal ideas. I'm moving to California. Mm-hmm. I said, well, I said, you have a skill set. You are a good nurse and, you know, you're working on becoming a nurse practitioner and you have a huge amount of skill set in that area. I said, if, if things go crazy and you need a place to be, I know you're a hard worker. You'll understand that your ideas were wrong at that point. <laughs> Come over here. We're growing food and our little community could use somebody who can do surgery Mm -hmm. with limited resources and this person. But but that's an issue right? uh, in that our medical industry is really catering towards having to have all of the latest, greatest and best technology. Right. And so a lot of the very skilled people in the medical industry, if they were put in a third world country scenario, Mm -hmm. walk into a clinic in Mexico, they would be very, very limited because they rely too much on modern technology. Right. Which is this person that I was talking about um, 
travel nurse went overseas some for doing that for that purpose. You right. Know, this is why when I'm saying someone who is in the medical industry that is is somebody I would want on my team. Mm-hmm. We're talking about. So, so then the biggest challenge is. Will they be able to make it? Make it. Will they be able to get there? Right. Mm-hmm. Which in ca- in the in the case of this person, they've moved back to Texas because California failed them, and they <laughs> Texas a comp- is a huge state. Right. So even within Texas, right. there are challenges mm-hmm. to get there. And so, for example, uh, in our particular situation, there was a big natural boundary between me and some of my family, and recently. Things have changed, so they're on the other side of that big natural boundary. <laughs> and that is a huge relief because that was, you know, in, in our modern day-to-day life, we drive over the bridge m- multiple times a day and don't even think about it. Right. But in the case of a collapse where you don't know what's going on, it was going to be extremely difficult to logistically, how are we going to get them to us from where they are? And, you know, that's another thing that a lot of uh, the prepper community, if you will, uh, a lot of them are very good on having a bug out bag. Like Mm -hmm. I've got this bag ready by the door. So if I have to go to my bug out location, uh, they're ready for that. But most of them drive to work and do not have a get home bag. <laughs> like what are the resources that I'm going to need on my person so that where, where I'm working at or where I'm shopping at, if something were to happen it, there, how would I get home mm-hmm. in order to begin to get things together? So uh, yeah. interesting things to consider. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I don't have a bag. I don't have a bug out bag anymore. I used to. Um, but when, when my place became the bug out location, right. <laughs> I'm not leaving. Right. I'm, I'm bugging in. Right. But, I'm, so I'm my not. concern now is when I travel. Right. How do I get home? How do I get home? You need a bug back bag. Right. <laughs> That's get home say. bag. <laughs> well, there's, yeah, there's nowhere better now. Yeah. You know, you see that. Okay. Yeah. Well, worst case scenario. Okay. I'm going to go to somebody else's place. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm going to Paul Ball's house. Right. Yeah. Back in the day, that was where I was going to go. So I lived in a town over, and my plan, if things went crazy, was I am leaving my house. I'm taking all of my important possessions, and I have a plan to get all of this stuff to another location. Right. That was the plan. And then I moved to a place where my location is the location to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I have been preparing this location. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, and there's, and there's a lot of people that are that way, you know, we, you know, I mean, that's the start with the prep, you know, you start with the bug out bag yeah, and you keep moving. And so I'm, I'm at the point now where my friends need to have a plan, a bug out bag and a plan to get to me. Yeah. Right. And then sometimes you have to have the hard conversations like where some of my family has said, well, if that happens, we're going to come to you. And I have to very bluntly say, well, number one, how are you going to get there? Mm Mm-hmm. And then number two, I'm not sure you have anything that will benefit us once you get here. I don't know that you would be welcome because you would just be a burden on what we have here. And exactly. sometimes those are very, very hard conversations to have, but they people need to wake up and realize that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and it is, it's, it's a good thing to be thinking about for them. You know, we were talking about that last time of putting yourself in the mindset now of you know, getting out of your comfort zone, learning new skills and that sort of thing. And it'd be good for them to think about it at this point. Like, oh, well, maybe I do need to add some some useful skills to my list, you know, and uh, right. it'd solve that problem, honestly. Yeah, right. and, so, and so that's the question you can have with people, you know, um, what do you have to offer? Mm-hmm. And data entry is not going to be one of the things <laughs> right. that we will need. Exactly. Which is why I bring up my friend with, that's a nurse. You know, when I first offered her, you can bug out with us. Mm-hmm. It was because she's a born again Christian, and she has a skill set. Yeah, and I you, told her, you I trust said, her on a personal level. I trust yeah. you on a personal level. You're not going to stab us in the back. Mm-hmm. I know that. But you know, we disagree politically on a lot of things. But you have a valuable skill set. Now it's not growing food, and it's not shooting a gun or mm-hmm. any of those things. But we've got that already. But if you know, you can do an appendix surgery. Mm-hmm. which is something this person has done with yeah. very limited resources in a not 
perfect environment. And I'm like, if you can do that, we don't need a lot of people like that, Mm -hmm. but you sure do need at least one. Yep. (laughs) You know? (laughs) And make sure you take care (laughs) of that one. Right. And there's like that, look, you know, if that's all you bring, that's enough. And also because, um, you know, that person is going to be desired by other groups. Right. So you, you're going to have to also consider, okay, we have this skill set person, mm-hmm. but this other tribe says we need that skill set person and you have to protect them. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. That's, and so that's why, you know, that's why we've had this conversation over the years, you know, and, and recently I've, I've re, you know, had that conversation again. It's like, Hey, we talked about this seven years ago. How are you feeling about it? Well, I thought you were crazy then, but I appreciated the offer. It makes me a lot happier now knowing that the <laughs> offer stands. Yeah, it know? still stands. It still stands. Right. And of course this person has progressed with that skill set that was valuable. This person is now more valuable in that same skill set. And what set. about their worldview and mindset on other issues? Has been very steadily trickling back towards my <laughs> worldview. <laughs> Uh, I mean, you can't live in California for multiple years and then have to leave yeah. yeah, because of the failed political system and then espouse that it's still the best political system. It's, you could, yeah. but you'd be crazy. And this person isn't crazy. So, I think Muslims do that a lot. <laughs> they flee their Muslim state and then they um, loosen and put it up there. Come on. It's all saggy. It, I told you it needed a blue pill when it first started. <laughs> There's, thank you. Oh, just t- tighten it. Goodness up. gracious. It's so loose. But that is, you know, that is the thing. You, you do need to have these hard conversations with your friends and your family. And all of the people, you know, I've had a lot of people t- say the same things like, oh, I know where I'm going. You know, they come over to the house to eat a meal. You know, a church member comes over and says, oh, well. I see all your preps. I know where I'm going. And I'm like, not unless you're bringing something. Yeah. You're not, you're not just going to show up. You don't Every, have a whole apartment building complex to house everybody? Not yet. Okay. Hmm. The compound is coming along, but it's not there yet. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> but, and just like you were saying with a family getting, getting closer, you know, I had one of my best friends that was living two hours away. And I told him, I was like, that's, that's too far. That's too far. You're too far away. You know, you need to be closer. You need to be somewhere, um, you know, that, that we can have mutual defense, mutual protection, help mm-hmm. each other out. Um, and they listened and moved five minutes away. Bought some land, started getting ready, you mm-hmm. know. And so, you know, every time we successfully do that, and get our group a little bit more cohesive, planned out, more people in a in a geographically close location, people that we trust. That's going to help us if the worst case scenario happens where it does turn into family only. Well, if your family group that you trust with your life completely is 38 people at four properties within a 10-minute drive, you're in way better shape than almost any other family. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, if that's as small as it gets for you, mm-hmm. of the people, that's your core. So that's a good core to start with. And and all of us, I mean, we we live in, in you know, outside of city, city limits, more rural areas and stuff, but there are a lot of people that I think still have that go bag situation because maybe they actually, they have a, you know, a decent amount of, uh, you know, cash and everything, and they have uh, a house on the lake and everything, and that's why they still are in the go bag situation. That makes sense if you got your your lake house retreat and that's your place to go, you know, of course they're not in the homesteading type situations. Mm-hmm. They still need to, you know, get a little further along in that, but and know. make sure you're going to that place and meeting your neighbors and mm-hmm. so that you're not some stranger right. showing up to, you know, Oh, we see you once a year for three days. You're not going to be adopted immediately into no. the inner circle. They may the have already location. cordoned off the neighborhood and you may not be allowed in. Right. Yeah. And they may already have, plans to house somebody else in that vacant house that you own yes right so think about Mm -hmm. that i mean and you say oh i own it well okay i mean yeah you only own it as much as you can force your ownership on the local community possession is nine tenths of the law right 
Yeah, I mean, and some people, some people maybe are are uh, you know friendly in, in in a way of like, oh yeah, we do, do know that you own it. And we'll honor it just because we're honorable people. You can't count on everybody doing that. But also, there's a situation of they might be like, okay, so you got the you got the the deed to it. You're like, well, not on me, duh. I was like, well, anybody can say they own it, and three people already have come up and said that they owned it. So you're number four. I don't right. believe you. I don't trust you. And we're going to, it's a vacant house and it's ours now. <laughs> never met, never met you before. And yeah. my cousin is already here living in it. Mm-hmm. And, and, and they brought a U-Haul full of mm-hmm. the, all of their preps that they've had stored in a shipping container because they knew they were going to bug out, but they were, they were waiting for the last minute and they yeah. brought, they brought, you know, batteries and a tractor and, you know, <laughs> And their plan was to come live in this vacant house. <laughs> yeah. Right. What are you going to do about it if that's your house? Are mm-hmm. you going to fight the whole community? You're not going to win. Yeah. You know, if that's if we're getting down to the family unit. And that kind of gets uh, down into a, a, a more gritty type situation. And um, I used to live up in New York and we I lived like uh, around like two hours or so from New York City, upstate and everything. And I was a you know a kid and everything, and I was I remember my dad would say you know if something really bad happened like really just you know collapse type situation, you have a certain amount of time before there is a horde of people they're going to be running walking through this this area of the world through this county through this town looking a for food horde of people and they're starving and they're some of them are armed and they're they're ready to do whatever they need to do to get money and well, not money food and um. You know, like there's a lot of people in this country, a massive amount of people. And some people they've got their their house and their garden and they're they're all homesteading and everything, but there is a lot of people that aren't. And if you know, if you have just an instant collapse, which is horrible, you know, what happens to the millions and you know, hundreds of millions really people? I mean, they can't just stay in a city, you can't just just be there in an apartment building with with no food, no running water, no electricity. You're just there. You got to leave the apartment building. You got to maybe walk out of out of the city if you can. And yeah. but and, then there's all the suburbs you got to go through, and they're already note, full. You know, and it, it's a very dire note. But the reality is, most people will not make it out of the big city. I mean, you'll they, have, they will die. You'll have before they leave. You'll have have people that that are are strong and they're able to do it. You'll have you know young single men in good condition and they're vicious and they'll do what they need to do and they'll get a vehicle that has some gas still in it and they'll get out you know right and but uh, but what we talked about you weren't here for that last podcast at the end of it but what we talked about it is psychologically a lot of people will not leave i think that's what he's bringing up even if they had the ability a lot of these armed people that you know they're they're running the gang that person's not leaving the mm-hmm. gang is their family yeah, and they are going to go to the the supermarket and collect all the food, mm-hmm. and they're going to have it, and they're going to go house to house, and yeah. if you have anything stored, they're going to take it, um, and they're going to stay mm-hmm. in the city for a long time. Yeah, I mean, before they have to leave, water is going to be the big challenge in the major cities. Yeah, right. Not food. It, it's going to be in the short term, clean potable yeah. water. Yeah. Right. Well, but I mean, not even the short term for months. For a city, yeah, because cities, right. for a large cities city, awfully complex. They have, very few have any wells. Right. They're absolutely dependent upon the water treatment plants mm-hmm. and the power to get the water to the places. So, water is going to be the critical uh, thing in big cities, not food. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I guess you know, in, in other times in in the past, you've always had wells. You know, you had. You had right. But wells in the city and whatnot, and uh, and lots of cities are made on water. You know, not every one. A lot of them have have you know a river running through and whatnot. Usually, they're really nasty. Yeah, you can't. <laughs> you start yeah, drinking that that river clean, water, clean potable water yeah, that right. you can actually drink out right. of. And most mm-hmm. of those people aren't going to have a way to purify it. Mm-hmm. Right, and a life that is and... going to uh, take a lot of people out. Right, yeah. and that's something that you know we should acknowledge. Um, in in a worst case scenario. Society has fully collapsed. The grid is down. You know, the word that we're talking about here, worst case scenario, there is going to be a mortality rate of 50% in the first two weeks. It's not going to take long 
for a huge percentage of people to die. And, and that's something that we do need to, you know, you do need to think about and understand that that Mm -hmm. if that's, that's why we try to prevent the worst case scenario yeah. collapse. Yeah. Right. We do not want we that. We do not yeah. want that. This, this show this. Is, is not a like, we're, we're just, you know, antsy for chaos. We are, we are not anarchists. Right. We don't want to, we don't <laughs> want a civil war. Like, I don't, I don't want to see people shut up or starving. I especially right. don't want to see a kid starving. I hope I can go my whole life and not have yes, to deal with that. Indeed. But, right. you know, we're, we're, we're not talking about it because we like the thought of it, but you got to, you got to right. be able you to gotta know what you're trying to prevent. Yeah. There's yeah. a reason we say we want to prep, but we want to be on the biggest boat possible. Mm-hmm. We don't want, we don't want the to collapse to get down to the family unit because if that happens, we're looking at yeah, the mortality rate is catastrophic. That is severe. We want to be as robust of a, of a unit as possible mm-hmm. to prevent these, these yeah. problems. Right. And in your large cities, the other thing besides just the water issue is the dead body issue. And so the the corruption of the corpses and the disease is going to just add insult to injury. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the fact that most people are medically dependent, that uh, they are absolutely dependent on being able to get their pharmaceuticals, and without that, they will die. Right. Yeah. And I think... What's a, what, a little a little strange in our, in our society, our society is an old society. You know, most of the people that you, if you just go out in society, you see a lot of old people doing the normal stuff. I mean, it's almost, it's, it's, it's weird. Just almost every like normal aspect of society, people are oh, 40s, 50s, 60s. This is the, the normal age of, of people doing things, you know, and a lot of those are the people that are medically dependent, you know, people with diabetes, people with all kinds of various other issues and stuff. And you see in third world countries that the average age is very low. You know, it, of course, people do get to those ages, but those aren't the average age for people just walking around. You know, most people making subway sandwiches aren't seventy years old in other places. But yeah. well, that's not weird for us. We walk yeah. in, and the manager of the subway sandwich place is seventy years old. It's a normal thing yeah. in our society. Right so now. in a in a yeah in a catastrophic situation, I think you'd have a, a very um, disproportionate a, a lot of a lot of children dying which be really really sad a lot of older people dying medically dependent people dying and stuff and your the demographics would quickly shift to more of a third world country demographic in the worst case scenario right. where everything just collapses and but chaos. so with that in mind though then you also need to have a plan of how do we handle the the dead bodies well if you're in the big city that's your problem i guess if you're not in a, a well if a, we're talking about rebuilding yeah, rebuilding. Well, if you're if you're rebuilding, I'd imagine. Okay, so like, let's say you have, you know, governments just kind of collapse. A lot of the smaller governments are very, very dependent on the government above them, which is the opposite of what our system was designed to be. Right. But it's what our system has become. Right. Where you know, if if you go to your your local you know city council or you know uh, county officials and stuff, a lot of them are not prepared to run their own jurisdiction on their own. They, right. they are just a middleman to to deal with with you know facilitating you know the state controlling this area essentially. Right. And if there is no state, then a lot of them would probably just flee not show and, up, flee in panic. Well, that's yeah. what I was saying. Like yeah. the government, they, they just don't show up for the meetings. Yeah, right. it's just that's what would happen because they're at their house taking care of their family. Right. In yeah. that scenario, yeah, that's where you you or they're at Walmart down. pulling stuff off the shelves with everybody else, right? <laughs> you know, a lot of these people are not prepared. Yeah. So, you know, so I mean, is there a um, a thought to like go in and fill the void as quickly as possible and like, hey, okay, nope, nobody's at home no, in, upstairs when it comes to the, this this big city that's that's nearby. Mm-hmm. Maybe we should. You know, of course, you you, you kind of like a USSR situation. Everybody's running to the Kremlin to try to be the one that that fills the void. You know, and uh, but just somebody to to very quickly get get power back. You know, and to to be like, okay, the, the people that do the water treatment plant, please stay where you are. We we need we need this to keep working. You know, whatever you need, we're gonna get you the resources that you need. You need electricity. We're gonna find a way to do it. We're gonna get we're gonna get electricity routed to your area because we need mm-hmm. water. You know, like. Someone going in there and taking charge yeah, of the city. Electricity is not going to be the issue as much as the chemicals. Yeah. The water treatment plants are absolutely dependent upon chemical shipments. 
Yeah. Right. I mean, or even if it's like a, hey, can you just pump the nasty water and everybody's going to boil it and hopefully not very many people die. But at least we have water that we can boil at home, you know, but just get the water over there kind right. of situation. You but know? what you end up with, though, is in that situation, let's say a city is somewhat prepared. The city mm-hmm. officials, they're planning on having some sort of, this is our grid down collapse scenario we have people that are going to be at the water treatment facility with guns, protecting it, protect, keeping these people on the job. Mm-hmm. They don't have a choice. You know, you might have success with a totalitarian style yeah. of rigid government. But, of course, those people are going to need resources and they are going to go out and take them from the rural areas that are not under their jurisdiction mm-hmm. because the city doesn't live without the rural it, yeah, they can't. So you've, you've got multiple different possible dangers. You've got the danger of your next door neighbor. If you don't know him well and he's a, a terrible guy, he might come and, and shoot you in the back and take your stuff. Right. You've got the, the concern of the roving bandits, you know, people just going around trying to find resources and they'll do whatever they can do to get it. And then you have more of the almost like organized crime, gangs, mafia type stuff. You have, right. you know, somebody, this is my city and they treat it like their city state and, and the countryside around it is free game and they'll organize like right. raids instead and, of, you and know, if roving you're bandits. in a city, if you're in a city and someone has taken charge and because they're in charge, there is some electricity, there is some running water and they have a food depot and they're going out into the country and taking food and they're bringing it in they're going to have power. They, mm-hmm. you will. I mean, people will submit to that because if they can get a a little bit of something from it, if they yeah. can get in line and get some food, mm-hmm. and they can get some water, and yeah, they will obey the rules of this person. And that is something you have to plan for because if the city doesn't just collapse and starve, most likely it is going to be a suction on resources and you need to prepare if you're close yeah. to a city and yeah. you're a farmer you need to understand especially they are going to conscript farmer, yeah. you you are going to be slave labor to the city because the type of person that will take over mm-hmm. is going to be the mafia boss that was under the underground that has actual power not yeah. not power because of a vote a vote that you know most people don't even know who your name is if you're the mm-hmm. mayor you know, the, when when everybody goes home and there's chaos, who is not the people who are family? Mm-hmm. The the criminal group is going to be what takes over. I mean, we have seen yeah. this happen in other collapses. We have to understand that this is what's going to happen. So we need to go back and watch 1970 and 1980 <laughs> in the world apocalyptic movies and take notes. <laughs> yeah, to an extent, yes. There yeah. are some books I recommend. Um but that is something you gotta you gotta prep for and you gotta ex- yeah. expect. Now that's a short term thing because you can only suck the res- resources out of your suburbs for so long until uh, we've already got all the resources except for the ones we haven't that spoiled because it's already been right. a number. Well, that's why I was saying if you're a, if you're a farmer, you're yeah. gonna get conscripted. Yeah, they're gonna you know, and and that would probably if there if there isn't a moral group that is prepared and armed and dangerous and resi- resilient mm-hmm. that says we are not going to stoop to the, the way of going and taking. We are going to produce and we're going to defend what we produce and we are going to slowly build back a productive society that respect individual rights. We're going to build that. If we don't do that, the power vacuum will have warlords mm-hmm. that will take and you will be you know, there will be serfs and there will be kings and this is how things turn into yeah and it that those are your two options you either have a, a group of people that have the ability to tell the warlords no mm-hmm. they have the power to say you can come to here and no further and past here is freedom and we are going to protect it and we have the ability to do so mm-hmm. and when the warlord crosses the line being able to take care of it right. Mm-hmm. That's what I said. Enforce this border, right? Yeah, with weapons, right? Mm-hmm. Right, and there, and you say, yeah, you ravage your area, and we will build society back. So in that scenario, you know, that's where you have to be. You have to realize there will be warlords, yeah, because yeah. a vacuum always creates warlords, and those people are going to come in, and they're going to say, hey, we're going to take all the resources first, and then we're going to plant crops in the suburbs. 
and we are going to force you. Yeah. The gang members are going to force you to to plant and harvest because we don't necessarily know how to do it. But you know that is that <laughs> served them right. That mm-hmm. we've seen it throughout all yeah. of history. It'll go back to that. Now it it it's a very unpleasant thing to think about, but. I mean, we, we think of warlords and, and, and that, you know, that mafia, mafia type situation is a very negative thing. And it is. It's definitely not ideal. But I would contend that having a warlord that forces his serfs to farm the suburbs is better than having just a big pile of corpses in a big city and everybody's dead. Oh, true. But in my opinion. also the other thing not considered is the fact that most seeds are hybrid <laughs> and most plants now you're not able to replant the seed. And the knowledge about mm-hmm. uh, cleaning the seed and prepping the seed to be mm-hmm. able to replant is gone. Yeah. And most of the commercial seed that's available is not able to do what it's designed to do without the other commercial products being put to it. Right. Mm-hmm. You got to have the commercial fertilizer yeah. and all of the... In that situation, Monsanto is going to become a favorite curse word. <laughs> curse you, Monsanto. Bear. Yeah. Conagra. <laughs> seedless watermelons. Why would I want a seedless watermelon now? <laughs> and then when people do take the seeds and try and plant them, a plant may grow, mm-hmm. but no it may not produce anything. Which I've tried that. You tried it so many times. To- I've tried it so many times. Say, oh yeah, I'm gonna just see. Does this plant and you, it grows and you're like, oh wow, and then it blooms. You're thinking, wow, we're this is actually gonna work, and then no fruit appears. And you say, oh. so the plan, the intention is really starvation right. and mass die off, right? Not warlords. warlords being able to be right. farm lords. Yeah. Now, I mean, I do kind of feel like. Humans are as a as a as a species kind of resilient, you know. Even though individual humans die, you know, kind of like nature. Nature hates a vacuum. You're not going to have just. You're not going to have all of New York State be completely empty and devoid and just full of starving corpses. People are always going to live there. There's going to there's going to be problems, but somebody's going to be able to figure it out. You know what I mean? Okay. And um, but so. you know, the plan is to drop the population. Right. drastically and then and then come in and install yeah. and in the days where states. there was always going to be somebody there were the days when most people knew how to do something right and there's mm-hmm. still multi-generational farmers you know our pastor when we lived up in new york was a multi-generational dairy farmer and they knew how to grow grow their food for the dairy cows and they had been living on that farm you know we met the grandpa Grandpa was born on that farm, and he he passed away since then. But he would he would be like a hundred years old now, and he was born on that farm, and and they had cousins all over the place, and all of them farmed, and yeah, that is something people do think New York. You know, right. there there is the cities, and it would be chaos. But there's a lot of land in New York, and a right. lot of rural it's very people fertile. That yeah, and these people, you know, as long as they didn't get murdered. Would would be able to live. You could you could just isolate them, you know, overnight. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what you'll see. And is they're going right. to isolate. That's what I think. What he was talking. Yes. Right. We're, yeah. There's yeah. going to be a family. You're not, not going to have absolute destruction. You right. Know, you're going to have a lot of destruction, but you're not going to yeah. you're not going to get absolute. But even if you had a ninety percent die off in New York State, there's still going to be, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. It's a lot of people. Right. So what yeah. we're saying is yes, the, there you could have both you could have a horrible disaster that mm-hmm. seems absolutely apocalyptic. Yeah. And there still be seven hundred thousand people yeah. in New York State that are I mean living. You say and, apocalyptic. I'm I'm thinking of, of the book of Revelation. Not everybody dies. You right. know, in the tribulation, right? Like right. when you get down to what was it, one third of the U.S. Uh, of the of the world's population right. is left, or or maybe a little less than. I'm not sure exactly, but in that it'll ballpark. say something like, you know, this this plague comes along, and, and a third of you know people die, and then this that come this happens, but not everybody's dead, you know, and that's that is apocalyptic. It's the word apocalypse, you know, like right. that that's it, you know. But yeah, so we're not going to have, and, and and let's say you do have, let's say a city, and it just. They they were totally flat footed, totally unprepared, chaos. There was just starving. You know, th- those that could got out. Those that couldn't uh, died. For a tiny little bit, you had some people that kind of 
lived among the uh, among the the, the buildings and, and going through and, and getting any resources they could. And after a while, they extinguished all the resources and they moved on. You might have a little later a successful city that actually did survive. Well, they just go and repopulate that city again. It's you know yeah, a bunch of big buildings there and you know good resources or well, something that you could get resources out of infrastructure. Yeah, and just a lot of copper wire. So you 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 may have a situation where you you have a population replacement. You know these people are they're but that's going to take. Decades, right? That you're talking about maybe so. multi generational, right? Yeah, it's I think you'll end up with overnight. the cities. No, not overnight. In that, no. Yeah, in that situation, I think the cities would actually be the least populous thirty years later. I think they would be stripped. You would do. I mean, let's just thought experiment here. If we if we're living in this scenario, and we're ten years into it. And we have we've we know our community, we've got our county, and let's say we're on the the forefront of the rebuild process, and there is a city an hour's drive away that no one lives in anymore. It has no natural resources, they had already been used right. up. And within twenty years, even right. nature itself is going to right. be taking over that. Mm-hmm. So and what infrastructure is there is going to yeah. Uh, not be usable. Right. It, it so, takes very little time exactly. for nature to reclaim. So yeah. before the roads cities. get destroyed and the buildings start collapsing, we would do things like load up the 18 wheelers and we're going to drive in there and pull all of the pickup trucks that are usable, load them up and haul them to a parking lot mm-hmm. and take, you know, take what we've got that's worth anything and build a bunch of trucks at work. We're going to come in there and, pull all of the steel, you know, out of something or go, go to the Kubota dealership and grab all of the Kubota tractors and bring them. I was thinking of the Tesla right. dealership and get all the big Tesla batteries. Oh yeah. But those are the, that's what's going to happen. I think that the cities will be stripped. I don't think anyone's going to move back to the cities I in think, the, in the anywhere near future. I think you'd probably get a mixture of things. And, and I mean, we, we can just look at, you know, history, you'll have situations where there will be a city that's just, is just gone. Uh, it's interesting if you if you look up the old Philistine cities, the, the main five, you know, Philistine cities, you got, you know, this one like Ashkelon and it's just, there's, it's a modern city. There's all kinds of people living there. And you look up another one, Gath, and you look at the pictures and it's a few pictures of, of like some broken down, like, where the wall was like you just see the, the the base of where the wall was for a couple of little houses and that's like it it's like on a little mound and there's a couple rocks you know and uh so sometimes you have a situation where people do just they just give up on the city entirely and and don't bother other situations you know maybe you have one group of people like the the indus river you know uh valley civilization and for whatever reason, they collapse. But people live there now, you know, and I'm not sure if they I live in any of the same cities. it depends on resources. But. So, like, one city in particular that probably fits your scenario extremely well would be Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. That is so reliant mm-hmm. on everything coming into that city yeah. that there's no natural resources. Whereas other cities, they were built there because of yeah. their natural resources yeah. and right. the things that make it. Um, commodious to be, to be a city, and you could you could have a situation where you have, I mean, like with, with Tyre over in in uh, Lebanon. You know, there's like the old city and there's the new city. You know, the new city is on the island, and the old city is is on the, the the coast right across the way. And there's you can see old rubble and all kinds of stuff. There's the old right. and the new mixed together. You know, and you may have a, some sort of situation where, okay, let's say in New Orleans, it's an extremely advantageous place. It's it's on the the mouth of the biggest river on our continent it is a perfect place to have a city for trading reasons and all that sort of stuff. But New Orleans is also a terrible city with, if, if anything falls apart, New Orleans has got to be the first thing to go. I oh, mean, absolutely. like we, with, with, with the hurricanes that hit and everything, they already had the roving bandits and nothing fell apart except just their city had some, <laughs> some weather problems like, and right. they had the roving bandits. So like that city Maybe that'll be one of those mass chaos. Every the people that leave can't uh, that can leave do it. The people that can't die or whatever. Right. But and then, then eventually three years you have later somebody gets repopulated. But they may only have one little area of it. The rest of it, oh, all that 
area down there. Nobody lives and there. A lot of it will be underwater because the Mississippi River has been trying to reclaim that area because rivers change. Mm-hmm. And over the years, it has changed. And it's just recently that they have stopped it from changing and nature is wanting to reclaim it. So, yeah, so it may look very different in the future, but there may still exactly. be a city there. And they maybe right. will call it New Orleans. Maybe they'll call it something else. But that's probably a place that will probably get replaced. You know? Right. Yeah. Whereas, like you said, Las Vegas has nothing to offer anybody for right. location. It was kind of made for that reason. <laughs> you know. So it's pro- it probably would just become an abandoned, you know, like Petra, like the city of Petra. No, Nobody wants to rebuild that. Just leave it, you know. So... You'll probably get a wide swath yeah. of different results, so, I would think. Yeah, and in that scenario, yeah, you just you just you rebuild from the biggest group you got, man. And I would imagine what you yeah what what you want to do is you you're, you're thinking okay, my family we're safe and 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 we're we're doing what we need to do. We're we're growing the the crops. We're you know patrolling, protecting whatever. We've went and talked to all of our neighbors. <clears throat> we're all in agreement. We all want to do the same sorts of stuff. You know, we're going to think of ourselves as a unit. You start to expand as you can trust people. You get you get representatives to go and uh, talk to the other groups. Is that what you're trying to say? Uh, yeah. And yeah. eventually you start building a modular system where yeah. you can cooperate. Some sort of a representative government. Like a republic, yeah. Something yeah. like that. You build a little republic. That would be nice <laughs> if we had an example to go by. <laughs> yeah. There's actually a lot, but <laughs> I mean, we do have this one in front of us, the Constitution of the United States. So we just need to reread this. That's, yeah. That's what we're doing. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah. Just, that's, that's what you want. You want to start, do. you know, and like mm-hmm. we were talking about in the previous one, you know, in, in a couple of weeks, we're going to go and, and visit some folks that live, you know, a, a decent amount of ways away from us that we're not, we're not bugging out together. You know what I mean? Right. But we think in a similar way and, you know, if it's, if it's a sort of situation where you have to start building up, those are allies, you know, and those are ham radio people, you know, so those right. are people that we could get in contact with even before we are able to reach them physically. And you have those those types of situations mm-hmm. and you can, you know, you, you can, can do a convoy. They say, hey, we might have a really good year of crops because we might be growing better than they are in mm-hmm. their area, but they've got better machine shops. And we could say, we were in contact we say, hey, guys, you know what? We did really, really well on our beans this year Mm -hmm. and our rice did well and can we bring three thousand pounds of beans and rice and we need spare parts for these tractors and let's trade and we do a convoy and Mm -hmm. there's 12 trucks armed armed guard heavily armed (laughs) heavily armed convoy highway robbery is no longer getting a bad deal like it's actual highway robbery (laughs) right and we get and you take your armed yeah group of people of 85 people from the local community Mm -hmm. and you you drive to where that is you drop off the beans and the rice and you pick up your parts that you told them you needed and you drive home the farther away the the more difficult it's going to be right yeah so yeah and but if you if you know if they are building up their little area of, of people they can trust and you're building up your area you know you at some point in the future you might be able to meet up and actually you know, coalesce and become right. something a little bit bigger. But, you know, the, it'll be weird to see the migrations and the, and the population <sighs> changes and stuff. Cause and you the, can't predict it. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's just, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people, you know, and some people you may have a whole, this whole area just kind of stays the way it is. Everybody just kind of right. stays in place. In another area, you might have everybody leave and then other people come in and it's just completely different, you know? And um, I'm thinking the Amish country is going <clears> to <throat> pretty much stay like it is. Do they do guns? Do the Amish a, do guns? A lot of them do, but not all of them. That might be their problem. Cause they might, <laughs> they're actually, well, they're close enough to that. The Metro, the Metro of, of that's actually what I was thinking of when I said cities having surfs that yeah. do their food. Yeah. Is I would, I would be worried, especially, you know, if the Amish isn't armed well enough. Yeah, where is say, Lancaster? Is that in the east of Pennsylvania? I mean, I knew we could get there in a few hours drive from where we were. if it is, that's not good for them. I don't they're, think they're listening to the podcast, though, I don't so I guess so. we can't really warn them. I don't know. Meh. Well, you need to send an envoy. <laughs> yeah, you need to send an envoy. <laughs> but seriously, you know, if, you know, you get some cities in Pennsylvania and everybody knows where the Amish are, you know? It's not a secret. <laughs> it really is. You know, you get you get three hundred bad dudes. Yeah, as one group, 
show up and they say, hey, we're in charge now. And we, you pay us tribute in food or you die. Yeah. Don't worry, though. We don't use electricity. You don't have to be offended. <laughs> we don't yeah. have any. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's in the southeast of... Yeah, uh, of, yeah it's yeah. Not, not great. Now, um, pretty close to New Jersey, which in any sort of grid down situation, I don't want to be anywhere close to New Jersey. <laughs> right. So, so we say, you know, the Amish might have changed much, but that's probably not true. I, I, I yeah. would be shocked if the Amish, Amish weren't turned into serfs yeah. to you know land barons and I, going back that would surprise me if that didn't happen going back a little bit to the whole utah thing i honestly think that they would just they would keep on and they would be organized like i, I think that the mormon culture is tight enough and they're organized enough and i mean and they're to preppers be, let's be honest to be got part two years of, of food in the basement and it it is when you know almost anywhere you're going to be dealing with, like we were talking about Austin a little while ago, like any place you have, you're going to have something different mixed in with America. So, okay, you have you have a red state like Texas, where well, you're going to have a blue city like Austin. You're going to have a blue state like New York. Well, you're going to have red rural areas, you know, like the place that I used to live and everything. You're always going to have that mixture, but Utah really isn't that mixture. It's it, it's a desert and there's a big old city and everybody is Mormon. I know that is really big exaggerations and it's not entirely accurate, but it's more accurate than it is not. And I think that they would just carry on you know right. like the amish couldn't but i think the mormons could and yeah. that would be somebody that in the long-term future you'd be able to trade with yeah yeah you know they would be somebody that you could probably and mormons do guns yes. and they do fighting <laughs> and they've had multiple wars on this continent before <laughs> and they will yep. defend themselves <laughs> so you know yeah but uh yeah i think i think that's you know it, it's it's hard to predict how it would go yeah but that's I think that's the that would be the roadmap. And right. it would have to be the you would have to be understand that you're going to have to defend personal fr- freedoms, personal liberties. You know, this is going to yeah. be a fight because otherwise it will turn into the dark ages with kings. Those, I, I those think, are the only two ways that it goes. I think a, a difficult decision would be let's say you have your small small ish pocket, not the smallest pocket, but maybe this like this town or something or, or this 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 group of neighborhoods do we join up with the other one next door they don't we don't like everything they do but they're not they're never going to be perfect but if we do join up we're going to be able to defend ourselves a lot better and we're going to be able to get a lot more done you know and that's that's usually why you know people want to get bigger is it there's good reason for it but also you're going to lose something you're, we're going to we're going to lose our own representation we all think the same way and we all want to do the same stuff and they don't think that way you know you got you know towns even in our area different towns have different attitudes you know and some people are kind of nanny state you know and they want they, they your lawn can't be this over this height and all this sort of stuff and you got towns that they don't care this this my lawn <laughs> get off of it you know and for them to do we want to work together there's a benefit but you know of course that's a little little tiny difference you can get over and it's especially whenever it's chaos nobody cares about you know lawn height lawn height but you know you'll have do we want to join up with these people they'll make us a lot more powerful and we won't have to worry about the roving bandits but also we lose a little bit of ourselves you know and you can have to make that's those the trade decisions that you always make with countries but yeah. when, when you grow you accept authority over mm-hmm. you yeah for something yeah and so the decision is is it worth it and that's your personal decision that you're going to, have to make and then that's your community's decision that it will make without you once you join the community yeah then there may there may that's what we're talking right. about the biggest group that you can trust there may be come to a point that you're like you know what guys we have our little republic it's not even the full size of the old state that we used to be a part of but this is as far as we need to go I don't right. think we need to go any further. We can have a, a we can we can have trade treaties and we can yeah. get along with people and mm-hmm. but we don't need them to yeah. write our laws. And we we'll, we we don't have any any hope or desire that we're going to join some bigger monolithic thing like the US used to be kind of situation and we'll just stay a little republic, you know, the way we are and stuff. But I think another a, a difficult thing is is the the run for power because a lot of people i think are one they want to bug out they don't want to be vying for power with a bunch of people they want to be out at the lake doing their thing but if good people don't vie for power you're just going to have the mobsters vying for the power you know so right you might have some people that need to step up and, and take authoritative control of a city and and do it well you know not not abuse anybody 
because if they don't you'll have bad people doing it i don't know yeah but that's but. i don't think it would work the the amount the 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 iron control that you would have to have mm-hmm. to be that person doesn't mesh with the person who can that who respects personal freedoms mm-hmm. who respects individuals yeah and i don't think you i think i think you're just going to have to let the cities eat themselves yeah just as a as a thought you know there's there, there is, there's other mindsets than our American mindset. And of course I'm partial to, to, to ours and freedom and all that kind of stuff. And there's people in the world that they are willing to be a part of a system that has control and that's what they would prefer. Mm-hmm. Um, I, was, I was talking before, I think on the first episode, um, a, a Chinese friend I had, um, you know, he, he was saying that the, you know, the Chinese people as a culture, they don't like small government. They don't like weak government. They want, they've always been part of a big empire. It's always been centralized and it's always been powerful. And that's as a cultural, obviously you're going to have individual Chinese people that are different, but as a, as a general culture, that's their shared values that, I mean, we have the shared value of, we want independence and, and personal freedom and responsibility, you know, and power can work, but of course you got to have the a people that are okay with that. You may have a city that is kind of authoritative and it kind of works, but I don't want to be a part of it. You know, right. I would rather yeah. be my little Republic somewhere else. Right. And we can, <laughs> we know? can trade with that city, Yeah, but yeah. that's not going to be us. But, yeah. But I mean, that may be better so. than millions of people dying. So anyways, I think it was a good conversation. Yeah. Enjoyable. Well, yeah, well, enjoyable to talk, not enjoyable about the, the, the subject matter so much. Yeah. They won't be enjoyable in that situation. And hopefully, uh, we won't have to deal with the worst uh, possible right. situations. The more we can prepare and the more we can wake people up and get them to prepare, mm-hmm. the less we have to go down that road Yeah. before we can stop. <laughs> Absolutely. And All start right. over. Well, until right. next time. Soul cloak, baby. Yeah. Peace out, folks. <laughs>